My name is Jeff Ladder, and this is my journey. Just give me half a second here to get my brain straight. Holy that was dicey. In this video, I'd like to take the chance to go through with you and dissect part of the decision-making process that I went through and part of the philosophy that I have in training that I believed helped me have a successful outcome. The training flight was very typical of our training flights that we fly on a regular basis to part of the Abbotsford Airport, headed east to a designated practice area where aerobatics can be flown at altitude, and then we were working on the Yak-50 high show for the future. Once those aerobatic maneuvers were completed, we returned back to the Abbotsford Airport and decided to fly some circus to continue our training. It was during the go-around on the second touch-and-go that the event occurred. In this video, you will see that I apply power for the second touch and go to bring the aircraft back into the air. The aircraft will depart the runway, positive rate of climb, and will be accelerating quickly. Now I'll retract the landing gear at approximately 80 feet as the gear was coming up. The engine will lose power and the aircraft will begin to descend back towards the runway. I will lower the landing gear at this point and bring the aircraft back to the ground. Being this close to the ground with the gear now cycling up and power loss, the decision needed to be made quickly. I immediately looked at the airspeed and realized that I had excess energy which would allow me to lower the gear, allow the gear to extend and then land the aircraft. Additionally, I also knew based on where I was on the airport environment that I had 2,500 feet remaining of runway to bring the aircraft to a stop and that played in the decision to land with the gear down as well. In this video, you will see that I immediately lower the landing gear and you'll be able to hear the engine surging as I slow the aircraft to a three-point landing in the remaining runway available, but the engine is not producing power and the aircraft lands. You'll also be able to hear the engine misfiring uh, during the rollout phase. Once the aircraft was on the ground and recognizing that there was runway available, I elected to use light to moderate braking instead of being hard on the brakes. This is, of course, to prevent a nose over or to create a condition that would allow a ground loop by bringing the aircraft to a moderate to light braking stop and then I was able to assess whether an evacuation was required. Once stopped, I assessed that there was not an immediate need to evacuate the aircraft. The crash fire rescue as well as airport service vehicles were en route. I let the tower know that I was shutting down the aircraft and then exited the aircraft. As a secondary note, had there been more altitude, I would have elected to open the canopy or more importantly, if we would have been forced to land the aircraft off field or off airport, then I would land with the gear up and the canopy open. And the reason to land with the canopy open off field is to prevent the risk of being trapped inside the aircraft and making it easier to evacuate the aircraft. All of these decisions needed to be made in a timely manner, in a correct manner. And it is the pre-flight briefing and the pre-flight preparation that played a big role in the successful outcome where I was able to make those correct and timely decisions. Here we are, just 42 minutes prior to that event. I'm in the aircraft. It doesn't matter whether I'm in the 737 or the uh, Yak-50. I always take the time to review the emergencies that will pose the greatest threat to that flight. In this exact example, I'm currently going through an engine failure close to the ground. I review an engine failure at altitude. I review the bailo procedure, and then I pick one other emergency to review for that flight. It's an important part of my process to go through that visualization and to go through that self-talk. Uh, so that in the end I'll have the emotional control that will allow me to make that appropriate decision in an appropriate time frame. As you can see from the video you just watched, there were many factors that led to a successful outcome during that situation. Some of those were external factors such as the location at which that engine failure happened and the runway length remaining that I had the opportunity to land on. 
some of those other factors that are equally as important during this were my preparation before flight and the methodology and the system that I go through so that I am ready for these emergencies. For myself, I've always used the GVSE, which is Goal Setting, Visualization, Self-Talk, and Emotional Control. I also approach every flight in the same manner with the Plan, Brief, Execute, and Debrief model. Again, that isn't to say that there aren't other models and other types of programs or systems that pilots may use. This is just the one that I use, and it led to a successful outcome. I hope that there was some benefit to people who were watching this video to see how I dealt with the emergency. As for myself, during our debrief later, there were many things that I also took away. The cause of the engine power loss and failure has been found. It was a failure of the pressurized carburetor to meter fuel air mixture properly to the engine. In this case, it metered pure raw fuel, which essentially flooded the engine, causing its power loss. If anybody has any questions about the systems that I use or the philosophy that I use to flight training, or if you have questions about operating these vintage Eastern Bloc aircraft, or questions about air shows, aerobatics, warbirds, really anything aviation related, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can contact us at info at jefflatterairshows.com. Thanks for watching.